submit all. Hello and welcome to today's workshop. My name is Lynn Gidluck and I have the uh, distinct pleasure of of uh, working with the uh, leading the Community Engagement and Research Centre at the University of Regina. I hope uh, your year is off to a great start for you and that you and your loved ones are healthy, happy and enjoying this really beautiful weather that we're having this week. Uh, while we're meeting virtually today, my physical office is located in the classroom <laughs> building on the University of Regina campus in beautiful Treaty 4 territory, the traditional territory of the Cree, Soto, Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota First Nations, as well as the homeland of the Métis. One of the things I am really excited about this year is working more closely with the University of Regina's Indigenous Engagement Office. Um, before the holiday period, we had such a great meeting with Lori Campbell, who is our university's Associate Vice President of Indigenous Engagement. Lori is moving our university in such great directions and it's so encouraging to have someone on campus as passionate about ensuring that research done at the university be driven by the needs of, of the community as we have. So um, although most of you who are attending today's workshop know the Community Engagement and Research Centre from our toolkit workshops like this one, most of our time is actually spent creating partnerships between re university researchers and community-based organizations to do research together. So we're embarking on an interesting collaboration with Luther College's nonprofit and voluntary sector studies network and the Faculty of Graduate Studies to help graduate students partner with community organizations. So if you have an idea that would be a great thesis or dissertation or research projects, mm -hmm. please reach out to me. Luther's very own Colleen Strau and I start meeting with the uh, students next week and a number of them haven't picked their topics yet so no promises, but you know uh, we're hoping that we can really meet some of those uh, community research needs. Now back to the reason you're all here today. Today is the fourth of eight workshops that we will be hosting between now and May aimed at helping better serve diverse community members and improve organizational culture. Um, please mark um, Tuesday, February 7th um, in the evening this time from 6.30 to 9 p.m. on your calendars for our next toolkit workshop. When we're planning this session, which is going to be during Black History Month uh, with the topic of equitable engagement with the Black community, we were invited by the Saskatchewan Council for International Cooperation and an organization called Black in Saskatchewan to collaborate with them on an in-person event. So they're eager to help us organize a panel presentation from experts in the health, social work and educational fields to speak on the topic of forward together, equitable public engagement with the black community. This is gonna be a great event folks with some African cuisine and entertainment. And it's gonna be held at Mount Zion Parish, uh, which is on Broder Street in Regina. We'll share more details once they're finalized. Um, if you're not on our email list, please put uh, it, your name and your email in the chat box and I'll be sure to add you. One last thing, I really would like to thank our sponsors for this event, the President's Office at the <laughs> University of Regina and the South Saskatchewan Community Foundation. Thanks to our sponsors, we're able to continue to offer sessions like the one you're attending today at no cost. With no further ado, I'm pleased to pass things over to Sherry Hildred. I can't tell you how much I respect the work that Sherry does. She's a passionate advocate for the nonprofit sector. And although she's one of the busiest people I know, she's one of the most organized and most efficient. And those of you who have attended previous training sessions by her know that you'll go away with some practical advice that you can start implementing right away. So take it away, Sherry. Oh, uh, great. Thanks so much, Lynn. And again, uh, thanks, Lynn. And the Community Engagement Research Centre for the opportunity um, to do this webinar and connect with the community. And, and you're so right. I'm so passionate about the nonprofit sector and thinking about ways we can do things better. And that's really what, um, you know, what these webinars are focused on. And I'm so glad, Lynn, that you talked about that cultural component. Um, when we get this topic of the generational divide started today, one of the areas that we're going to focus in on first is actually around 
the importance of organizational culture, um, values of an organization, and the link to actually um, retaining our employees and volunteers of all generations. And then we'll look at what some of those um, really specific sort of challenges are, what some of the um, uh, approaches can look like. And there are actually four very specific, <clears throat> pardon me, strategies that I wanna share today. And then we'll also um, have a look at one particular tool. It's a very simplistic tool to use. It's so much fun with employees and volunteers to start breaking down that generational divide through better understanding sort of what makes each of us tick. So I'm um, really excited to get into the topic today. Um, again, as you many of you will have read in the poster that you put out, Lynn, um, the idea of looking at these four distinct generations in the workforce and each really having its own um, unique char characteristics and dynamics and tendencies. Um, I was saying, folks, uh, when Lynn and I were chatting here this morning before the start of the webinar, um, we never want to generalize or, you know, put, put individuals into boxes, but the reality is we do have characteristics, dynamics, and tendencies that we see in the various um, generations. So again, for those of us that are leading people in our organizations, employees and volunteers from all four generations, it can be a challenge, but, you know, we break that down through, as I say, really understanding what makes individuals um, tick, and through that we can avoid or at least minimize or reduce some of that division or some of that um, conflict that might be experienced. So again, today I wanna to look at um, identifying ways that we really can encourage productive engagement across the generations, a productive um, intergenerational collaboration, and certainly some recommendations around practices, um, processes, um, different approaches that we can take to really support um, inclusivity in our um, organizations and looking at those various elements of diversity. So really excited to get into the session today. And again, thanks so much, Lynn, for the opportunity. And of course, thanks to the funders that you noted. Um, just to get us started, folks, before we get into the material, um, the, uh, the material content today, a couple of things I just wanted to provide, a little bit of overview of logistics. And first and foremost, um, you know, a, a real sincere, um, invitation to each of you to reach out to me um, at any point, um, you know, through the session today, you're welcome to ask questions. Um, Lynn always does a great job of sort of monitoring the chat for me so we can answer questions as we go. And I do try to preserve about 15 minutes at the end of the webinar. So we have about 90 minutes together. Um, try to preserve about 15 minutes for any questions. Um, that being said, I often find that folks will take the information away and um, either start using tools or digesting the information in your organizations. So certainly, um, if questions arise, if you're experiencing certain challenges, um, when we talk about generational divide, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm always happy to receive emails, always happy to have conversations um, beyond the webinar. And also just a friendly reminder, this webinar is being recorded. So anyone who is unable to attend, um, Lynn will be sharing this webinar as well. So just uh, mindful that the webinar is being uh, recorded. However, when we start our question and answer at the end, we typically shut that recording off. Um, so again, we have about 90 minutes together, really looking forward to this opportunity to share a little bit more information on the um, intergenerational divide, um, looking at those characteristics and dynamics of the various generations, and certainly before we do that, I do have um, just a couple of other notes around uh, recognitions that I want to make, materials I've referenced in the development of this webinar for you. Um, I also want to note um, for myself, folks, uh, I actually have two offices, one in Southern Saskatchewan in Regina and one in Northern Saskatchewan, which I opened a couple of years ago. Uh, my work too has increasingly um, become more active in the First Nation um, sector. And so having uh, an office here on Territory 6, um, just outside of Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. So again, um, want to uh, uh, acknowledge the lands that I work on each and every day, whether in Southern or Northern Saskatchewan. Um, so with that, folks, just a quick little overview here. These are some of the reference materials that I've used in creating um, this webinar, and you'll see me reference them throughout the session today, and where uh, particular um, resources maybe aren't noted here, I sometimes will just include them on the individual slides. So I just want to give credit where credit is due um, to the resources that I've used in putting the webinar together for you. Um, I also want to really reinforce uh, whether you are a large organization or a small organization, 
Um, the strategies that we're going to look at for in particular right at the end of the webinar that I want to look at, they really do apply. Um, this is just a handful of some of the organizations that I work with or have worked with over the last couple of years um, across the province and also um, across Saskatchewan, so a number of pan-Canadian clients. So again, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's, you know, hundreds of employees and volunteers across uh, the country, or if it's a smaller, more localized organization, I want you to know that these strategies and approaches really are scalable um, to any size of organization. So again, um, keep that in mind as we're looking at the materials today. A uh, few highlights for our session. I wanted to give a bit of an overview of the topics we're going to cover. And you may not think that this has a fit, but without it, we will never get to this generational um, divide discussion uh, without considering organizational culture and values. This is critically important. And we're going to look at some information that sort of um, in a very material way demonstrates the importance of addressing, being mindful of generational divide. What impact does it have to the organization if we don't look at our organizational culture, if we don't look at the values? So the idea of aligning both our employees and our volunteers um, who have shared values. So what does that look like and how does it support this idea of addressing generational divide? Um, there are some generational subgroups that we're going to look at. And again, uh, really want to reinforce, you know, we always hesitate generalizing or putting the individuals in general buckets. However, we do have um, some generational subgroups that really do have their own unique characteristics. Um, and it will help us understand what really makes them tick. In turn, we can reduce um, that turnover rate of both employees and volunteers and I have some really interesting stats um, that I want to share with you. And uh, there's another webinar that I do around volunteer attraction and retention. So the, some of the research more recently um, really resulted in some interesting statistics that I thought would also be perhaps of interest to folks in this webinar when we talk about addressing generational divide. Why is it important that we address it? And how can we redu reduce turnover? So um, some uh, interesting other links I've embedded in the webinar. So again, we want to look at a number of different perspectives um, from our various generations, but we also want to look at how organizations um, can look at the values they have, look at that alignment, and how can we really do a better job um, of breaking down this generational divide. Um, finally, I do have for you, um, as I mentioned, there's four strategies I want to talk about, but there's one tool um, that I put together, and I'm going to review it with you um, throughout this webinar. And once the webinar is complete, Lynn is actually going to email it out to you guys. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a direction and instruction on how to use it, but it's an incredibly um, uh, easy to use tool, doesn't take very long, very applicable, whether it's employees or volunteers, and it can really help us understand um, the perspectives, uh, the preferences, the approaches that individuals take and in better understanding where we're say, the same, but where we're different can again, really support how we're going to build out um, processes in our organizations that will help with that generational divide. So again, uh, we'll have that tool sent out after the webinar today and I'll review it with you. We won't be using it in the webinar today, just in the interest of time, but I'll give you an outline of, um, of how to use it and we'll get that sent out after the session. So looking at, um, some of these uh, uh, focuses, and I've said sort of the first focus here, paying attention to generation, generational divide and why it really matters. So if we look at even just the cost, so cost of employee turnover, and I actually have some stats for you on volunteers as well. Um, we are looking currently at um, some of the more recent research and this, and there's actually an author that I quite favor, Eric Douglas is his name. Um, that has also done some additional research in this area. So what we know is that on average, approximately 22% of staff turnover occurs within the first 45 days. So the idea of looking at our organization, our culture, our values, and how do we share that, for example, when we're do doing job postings, same with volunteers, when we're um, seeking volunteers in our organization, making sure that we're um, really having that strong cultural and values alignment to avoid uh, the turnover that can certainly happen. So with staff, first 45 days, 40% of senior managers fail within the first 18 months. 
And that doesn't mean they necessarily fail in their role, the fit fails. So again, what are we missing when we're bringing um, employees and volunteers into our organization? Um, another interesting stat, 60% of organizations don't set goals for new hires. And that um, percentage is actually fairly close for volunteers as well. So the idea of really, um, you know, early on wins when individuals join the organization. So I thought you might find some of those stats interesting. Um, the cost, folks, when we talk about um, when we talk about employee um, turnover, by the way, I just wanted to mention um, generally it's about um, 20 percent. So if you take, you know, a salary, let's say a sixty thousand dollar position, um, the cost of turning the, over that position usually is around 20 percent. So it would be about twelve thousand dollars when we look at uh, direct costs. So advertising, um, you know, exit interviews, severance pay, perhaps as well as indirect costs. So, so even things lost production, lost knowledge when individuals leave an organization. So again, all the reasons why it matters. Um, with volunteers, some of the most interesting information um, coming out of both Stats Canada and um, the Nonprofit Leadership Institute who calculate every year the value of the volunteer hour. And I just find these statistics amazing. Um, in Canada, we have 79% of Canadians aged 15 and older, 79% that will volunteer, um, equals about 24 million individuals. And to give you a sense, that's about 2.5 million permanent full-time positions and organizations. Um, the Nonprofit Leadership Institute uh, calculated in 2000, April of 2022, uh, the estimated national value of volunteer hours is currently uh, almost $30 an hour, $29.95 um, was calculated last year. So again, you know, incredible value that we're receiving from our volunteers. Let's make that investment in really understanding what makes individuals tick. How are we going to attract them to our organization, but also how are we going to retain them? So again, even though we're going to get to the discussion of generational divide and looking at those four unique generations, I really wanted to start with where it matters and how to get started in a meaningful way. Um, again, when we look at um, this idea of the true cost of employee turnover, um, it can be upwards of three times an annual salary. So 20% is sort of the lower end. Um, comparative cost impacts, as I say, for volunteer turnover as well. So again, um, before we get into the generations themselves, how can we set the stage? What else do we need to be thinking about? And certainly, um, as I mentioned, the link between organizational culture and the values of the organization and the values of employees and volunteers. Um, what you're going to see here on this slide, just again, some really interesting statistics um, employees and volunteers that were surveyed, <clears throat> and this comes out of a study that was done 2021-22, uh, um, looking at what employees and volunteers were saying. Um, nearly two-thirds, and where I have employees, um, this is fairly equal with volunteers as well, um, nearly two-thirds of employees saying that their company does not have a strong work culture. Um, less than half of individuals in an organization really understand or know what the vision, mission, and values of the organization are. How can we have value alignment if there isn't a sharing of who we are, what we do, how we do it, and aligning um, that with the organizational values? So again, um, supporting productivity in you know, our organizations, um, creating a fun, enjoyable environment for folks. So what is this whole idea of you know, workplace culture, if you will? So I do wanna look at um, culture first, and then I wanna have a little bit of a closer look at where values fit. Um, and from there, we'll look at how that really aligns with when we talk about values of generations, again, in a general way, values of um, the generational divide. And then also the way I've put the webinar together, not only will, will we look at values, but we're gonna look at, well, what does that look like in the workplace then? Uh, what can we expect in the workplace? So again, um, having a look at, uh, as I say first, I wanna have a little bit of a look at this idea of organizational culture, how we structure ourselves with our vision, our vision and our values. And then we'll have a look at how that fits with our generations. So again, um, I've included a slide here, what is a mission statement. So again, the idea that 
we're articulating what it is that we do every day. Um, we're looking at our cultural norms. We're looking at what's encouraged, what's um, discouraged, accepted or rejected in the organization as we build values based on our uh, mission and vision. So again, we can use um, the mission of the organization, what we do every day, who we serve, to start thinking about and understanding, better understanding, particularly in nonprofits, um, how we're going to find that fit, individuals that are passionate about what we do and how we do it. So with the mission itself, um, I wanted to do a fun little exercise here for both mission and vision actually. Um, the idea of can we actually determine who a vision statement belongs to by um, simply reading the statement itself. So I did two little trivia pieces here for you for both um, mission and vision, just to play around and see if we can identify these organizations. And then I'll bring it back to uh, the local level with some uh, local examples. So for these two folks, and again, if you just wanna pop it into the chat, um, can you guess who these belong to just by reading the mission statement? Um, the first is, uh, drive advances in science, technology, aeronautics, and space exploration to enhance knowledge, education, innovation, economic vitality, and stewardship on Earth. So let's have a look. I'm just going to open my little chat box as well here. Yeah, you bet. Megan got it uh, very quickly. NASA, 100%. So again, language that clearly allows us to identify what the organization does, what we're all about. Um, the second one, folks, let's have a look at uh, our mission is to empower every person in every organization on the planet to achieve more. It's a little bit trickier, but let's see if there's any guesses. Empower every person in every organization on the planet to do more. Any guesses, folks? As I say, this one might be a little bit trickier. No guesses rolling in. Oh, United Nations, that was a great guess, Marianne. I love it, that great guess. It actually belongs to Microsoft, believe it or not. So yeah, so kind of interesting. Um, again, when we look at the mission statement of the organization, how we're sharing that direction, where we're headed, what we're all about. Um, the same thing is true with vision. So again, when we look at communicating our vision to all, all employees, all volunteers who we're trying to attract to the organization, it's about those gaps that we fill in community. So again, that longer term sort of vision around where are we headed? Um, sometimes vision statements will even be aspirational. So the idea that in a perfect world, here's what it would look like. Um, our position in the community, the relevance, um, what would community look like if we didn't exist? So again, thinking about our vision can be an excellent touch point as we set the stage for values and looking at the values that we want or that value alignment with the various generations that we're bringing into the organization. Again, just a fun little bit of trivia here for you folks, get our, our brains um, fired first thing in the morning. Um, a couple for you here. Let's see, again, feel free to pop it into the chat. Um, our vision is to be Earth's most customer-centric company, to build a place where people can come to find and discover anything they might want to buy online. Any guesses, folks? And coming out of the holiday season, I'm sure many of you played in this space. Amazon, 100%, uh, Megan, great guess. You bet. Um, the second one, let's have a look at this. To provide access to the world's information in one click. Any guesses, folks? Ah, Bob, you got it right off the hop. Google, you bet. So here's the vision, here's where we're headed. What does that look like for each of our organizations? So again, when we bring that back down to the community level and we start looking at, well, what are those motivators? Um, there are six general um, functional motivators that we will find uh, more predominantly with employees and certainly with volunteers in the nonprofit sector. And as you can see, the very first one is values. So the idea of connecting our organization mission, vision, values with the personal values of the individuals that come that are coming into the organization. So again, um, individuals that are really looking for those opportunities to serve in meaningful ways, they want to make a difference. Um, again, when we focus on the values, as I will with each of the generations, there can be some overlap. So for example, you could have um, a volunteer or an employee in the organization 
where they're looking at, um, you know, it's maybe not their final stop in their professional or career trajectory, but the work that's happening in your organization is going to provide very specific skills development um, that might enhance where they're headed, particularly with volunteers. Um, social considerations. So individuals looking for um, team building and oppor opportunities to really engage with others, um, engage with peers. So again, in organizations that use peer support models, um, when we're looking at employees or volunteers, we want to look at those that really are passionate about and um, are seeking out that idea of peer engagement. Uh, again, with understanding, professionalized in-service training and reflection, um, different opportunities. So again, variety within the employment and the volunteer opportunities. And again, a couple of other categories, um, particularly in the volunteer sort of realm, we look at um, individuals who maybe are moving more towards the end of their career and they're looking at wanting to give back. So they want um, their contributions to have significant value. Uh, we certainly know through various um, research papers that the dynamic of volunteers have changed. So no longer do they necessarily want long-term engagements, but they want to work on very specific projects. So it might be a gala or a fundraising event. Um, they want to work on something very specific um, by way of initiative or project, and they want to see the value of those contributions that they're making. Um, again, in the enhancement category for motivation, promoting leadership, development, um, uh, supporting organization through um, experience and really creating that culture, um, that upbeat uh, experiential culture within the organization. That's what they're looking for. So again, when we understand what staff and volunteers want based on these six functional motivations, again, they will overlap um, with the values discussion, but predominantly we see that values alignment. So again, alignment to the vision mission of the organization, the values of the organization. Um, so again, on as we move sort of from that culture side over into the values, when we're looking at um, setting the stage for our generational divide, um, as an organization, we talk about, well, what are our guiding principles? Um, how do we articulate how we carry out our mission? And are we articulating that clear to potential employees, really clear um, to potential volunteers? Um, there was one, um, one value statement that jumped out at me, and I thought I'd include it in this webinar. It comes to you from way. And so they have a number of values within their organization. Part of what they do when they are seeking um, employees and volunteers is embedding behavioral questions in their interviews um, that are based on their values. So I pulled one of the United Way values. Um, it's the value of service. And you can see here, um, they talk about being motivated by a strong commitment to service, um, service to donors, service to neighbors, service to the region uh, or the localized community that individuals are, um, that the offices are existing in. And they go on to say, our achievements are defined by our collective success of the communities we serve. So again, heavy emphasis on this value of service and in turn using that information to really um, share that message when they are seeking employees or they are seeking volunteers. So how can we early on find that alignment or um, identify if there isn't a fit? So again, we're making this investment, it takes an awful lot of time and um, energy to bring individuals into an organization. Let's really get it right um, by spending some time in considering values. And as I say, when we move into that generational um, examination, we'll have a look at the values of each of those generations as well. Um, at a, another sort of um, level here, I wanted to share with you uh, just another example. Um, this comes from Special Olympics Canada. Um, about a year ago, I want to say February or so of last year, um, I was asked to present at the uh, Special Olympics, Olympics um, Saskatchewan Leadership Conference. And we had a really good look at their vision, mission, and their values, and had a bit of a conversation. Again, because this was a leadership conference, we had a bit of a conversation around the values of Special Olympics and how they go about um, bringing and using really creative processes and approaches at all levels, um, at the local level, and of course, across Canada. So again, um, they were a really interesting organization to look at because again, um, they spend an awful lot of time in looking at 
here's our values as we're bringing individuals in, employees and volunteers, do we have an alignment? Are these individuals that are as passionate as we are about inclusion, that we foster inclusive communities? Are they as passionate as we are, um, you know, for the value of excellence, for example, elevating standards and performance? So again, a uh, real intrinsic and important link between the values of the organization and the values of the individuals coming in. And the closer that alignment to personal values, we know it's statistically proven through our surveys um, that individuals will stay with uh, organizations longer. Now, um, as we start to look at, well, what does that mean for values? Let's consider this. I've pulled a few different organizations. Um, you'll see Microsoft's mission, vision, values, top left-hand corner. Uh, Google's, uh, one of their value statements um, around avoiding mi micromanagement and creating a fun and freedom-based environment that really encourages um, openness, general um, ethics, and corporate citizenship. Um, you'll also look at KPMG's values where they use we statements. So we lead by example, we work together, so on and so forth. So again, when we're looking at our generations, folks, um, if we have characteristics and traits that really support um, a linear approach to the work that is happening, those individuals may do better volunteering um, in very specific capacities that have a structure to them. So let's say we're, we're planning a gala, uh, planning a fundraising event, and we have very specific things that need to happen um, to execute that event. Individuals that think in a linear manner are going to do much better. So let's say we have a volunteer who's come from a, you know, a Microsoft or a KPMG type background, they may do better working on initiatives or projects that follow more of a logical and sequential basis versus let's maybe look at a younger demographic who works in a far more agile or flexible way. Um, they've maybe come into their um, professional career working um, remotely or in a hybrid model. They're used to um, having to be flexible, having to change based on um, the pace of the work or the changes in the work environment. So again, they may do better on more um, creative type projects. So again, the values that we set out in our organizations uh, alongside our vision and our mission can really start to give a lens as to the individuals that we want to bring into the organization, really making sure we have that fit based on their preferences, based on their characteristics. So again, with um, values, culture and engagement, I know many of you are in leadership positions and um, one of the individuals that I've included here, you'll see uh, CEO Google, um, some material that he put together, it was Sundar put together at one point, talked about, um, you know, this idea of leadership and alongside our culture, alongside our values, what is it that we as leaders need to, you know, continually be thinking about? So the idea of, you know, caring for individuals in our organization, I think in the nonprofit sector, we do an incredible job generally of embracing differences um, within our organizations. And again, how does this support the volunteer um, and employee experience? Um, being mindful of what the volunteers need, what the employees need, what is their um, preference in engagement? Um, how are they going to do their best work, be most productive? How do we foster an environment of trust? So we're gonna talk a little bit about that later in the webinar. Um, and how important it is that we actually live the organization's values. So you'll see um, on the far left-hand side of the screen, just a little iceberg analogy. And this speaks to how organizations sort of demonstrate to the world that you know, public facing, if you will, um, this is who we are. So we have our vision, we have our mission, we have um, different strategies, we might have structures that set out how we do our work, um, the way, if you will, we say that we're getting things done. But where we really want to go today is this space under the iceberg. So this is the way we really get things done based on our shared um, assumptions, the norms in our organizations, the values that we have, uh, various values and differing values based on generations and how we can bring those together. So look at um, traditions, for example, or norms. Um, we're going to examine what some of those values around tradition and norms look like 
for the various generations. And we can very quickly see where there can be a bit of a bump or a bit of a, uh, a grind, if you will, between the generations. Um, as I say, four strategies I'll share with you to start breaking that down. So we can really get to a place where we have a little bit more of that um, intergenerational collaboration. We can't get there if we don't look at the differences, if we don't understand uh, the different approach and values. So finally, um, just lost a little bit of research here on values. This comes from Jim Collins. He's one of the authors. Um, I shared one of uh, the resources at the beginning of the webinar, um, From Good to Great. And so he talks about what great companies do differently. And he actually talks about um, the idea of um, the idea of you know good being the enemy of great. How can we take it to the next level? And really interesting, um, Jim Collins recently published a secondary um, book in addition to Good to Great, which actually focused on the nonprofit sector. So again, um, this idea of consistently focusing on building strong corporate or strong organizational culture uh, for for for-profit companies. They're going to make a lot more money. They're going to be a lot more stable. In the nonprofit sector, we will experience reduced employee turnover and reduced volunteer turnover. So again, final sort of thought, thought of the day um, based on the research um, on values. So with that, folks, let's get right into um, let's get right into our four generations that we want to examine. Um, having a look at their values. Um, as individuals, what that can look like in our workplaces, and how can we start um, looking for ways to have our intergenerational collaboration developed versus uh, maybe those barriers that would be experienced based on those dynamics and characteristics and preferences um, of the various generations. So you'll see here just at the bottom of the screen, um, Lynn Lancaster and David Stillman uh, wrote a book, really interesting, when, ge when Generations Collide. And you'll see here that um, there were a couple of quotes I've taken from their book, what really defines a generation. So thinking about the events and conditions that each of us experience in our formative years, um, it determines and really starts to set that lens of how we're going to see the world. Uh, when we talk about communication, basic communication model, we talk about our cognitive bubble or our field of reference or a field of experience. Um, the same is true with looking at what defines a generation. What are the events and conditions that are really informing how we see the world, how we interpret, how we perceive things? So in Lynn and David's book, they talk about as a result of these events and conditions, each generation has adopted its own generational personality. So again, never want to put folks in boxes. We don't want to be too general, but the reality is um, each generation has really adopted its own generational personality. So at a very broad level, and it became, again, because we're looking at sort of the uh, four primary um, generations today, when we talk about the workplace or these four distinct generations of baby boomers, uh, Gen X, Millennials, and the Gen Zs, um, we want to look at the importance of really being able to identify those characteristics and traits, um, understand why that generational um, difference exists. So again, this idea of a generational personality and looking at strategies for um, increasing that intergenerational um, collaboration in our environments. So again, the four strategies that I wanna share with you and they all link and tie back to this idea of values. So value of the organization. Um, we'll start first folks with our baby boomers. So let's have a look, again, take it in the context that we, uh, you know, intended here, that we want to look at general considerations when it comes to this generational personality. What has informed that personality? What has informed how we see the world? So again, the first group I want to look at, um, baby boomers. So um, for that period of time or that range, 1946 uh, to 1964, and you'll see in some, um, you know, some um, documentation, you'll see 1945, 1946. So again, not uncommon to see a, a bit of a, a slight variance in the start and end of those ranges for each of the generations, um, if you happen to do any additional reading or uh, research in this area. So what I wanted to do for each generation is um, 
just to see how much it resonates based on a few um, a few things that what are the events, what are the conditions um, that define that period of time that would be the biggest influencers when we talk about creating that generational personality. So I wanted to take a few lenses. Um, I selected a few biggest influencers. I selected pop culture and I selected home life and growing up. So those were the areas that I examined to come up with, again, this is not intended to be an all-inclusive list, but just to select a few events and conditions that started to define that generational personality for baby boomers. And in turn, what are some of the values um, that we know are characteristic of that baby, baby boomer generation? So again, um, some of those biggest influencers, events and conditions, not all-inclusive, um, television was invented. JFK assassination, Martin Luther King and the entire civil rights movement, for example. Uh, the Vietnam War, the space race, um, the Nixon resignation. In pop culture, we have the Beatles, Woodstock, uh, drive-in movies, American Bandstand, uh, Westerns, I Love Lucy. Um, so again, for some of you, I don't know the I don't know the generational divide in our webinar here today. So for some of you, these might be you know kind of a blast from the past, things you remember, and for others, uh, maybe you're not so familiar with them. Um, home life and growing up, um, we had post-war babies, um, time of social change, and much optimism. Um, families living in suburb areas, two-parent families, um, typically still with a stay-at-home mom, and this idea of the American dream, if you will, being promised. So again, um, that, that um, environment of optimism and um, sort of view to the future being, you know, this idea of an American dream, if you will. So when we look at um, the values that we generally see, as I say, generally see when we're looking at um, baby boomers, um, you know, ethical approach to how they engage at work. Um, it can be a bit of an idealistic approach. So the idea of two parent families, moms, that, you know, stay at home mom, much has changed since um, that time. Um, on the consumerism side, a, a little bit of the spend now and worry later approach. Um, there were other characteristics when we look at um, different topical areas, anti uh, positions around anti-war, anti-government, um, belief that anything is possible, uh, focus on equal rights and opportunities. I mean, that was certainly, you know, um, events and conditions that started to frame this generation. Um, personal growth was another area that we saw, and that was because of that optimistic sort of environment. Um, individuals really wanting to make a difference. So when we look at our baby boomer um, category, oh, so let me pop back there. When we look at our baby boomer category, um, the idea of what to expect at work. So for this group, um, they really were the individuals sort of coined as inventing the 50 hour work week. So the idea of um, a lot of effort, a lot of work, um, you know, need to work harder. Um, it's that ethical piece around the work environment, the need to be visible, if you will. Um, work ethic equaled worth ethic. So work equi uh, ethics really e equaling worth ethic. So that was significant. So this idea of work-life balance that we talk about today, and we will talk about that um, with some of our generations, that was not something that was even a consideration, um, never mind being, you know, predominant for our baby boomers. Um, work was really um, the anchor to their life. So the idea that, you know, um, I'm going to strive to do my best, there was value around team collaboration, no doubt, um, but wanting to really look at um, the idea of, you know, the hierarchy in the organization, climbing the corporate ladder, if you will, um, that work was really, for many, an exciting adventure in a lot of ways, and um, many individuals in this generation are quite anxious um, to, to please, but they would still challenge the status quo. Um, typically also we see with this generation that they dislike or tend to dislike more than other generations, um, change, change can really create conflict for them. So, um, if you're looking at your organization and baby boomers in your organization, if you have individuals that don't have a real appetite for change, um, they don't want to be agile and flexible. Uh, they like to have that status quo in place. 
Um, they want to hear their ideas, um, you know, sort of demonstrated in the organization. So their opinion, their input matters. And how are we really taking that and doing something with it? Um, so again, uh, when we look at, you know, this idea of what to expect in the workplace, those would be some characteristics or attributes. So again, I'll look at each of the four generations and then we'll maybe sort of examine, okay, well, well, where is that rub then? Um, you know, if we look at somebody who has a very sort of linear approach, doesn't like change versus um, generations that really do um, welcome and even encourage uh, flexibility and working in an agile environment. So our next group up, folks, is our Generation X, again, born 1965 to 1980, more or less. You'll see a slight, eight or a slight year difference in um, some publications or some approaches, but generally 1965 to 1980. And again, I've included the biggest influencers, pop culture, and home life and growing up. So again, what was happening um, for this generation, um, introduction of personal computers. Think about um, that and the way we um, work, do our work today. Uh, Fall of the Berlin Wall is a big influencer. Um, the Challenger, Space Shuttle Challenger disaster, end of the Cold World War and the first Gulf War. Um, again, pop, pop culture, what was going on in pop, pop culture at that time, Star Wars, E.T., uh, Nintendo, uh, Michael Jackson, sitcoms, for example, who's the boss at Full House, some of you may remember those. Um, home life and growing up, um, again, increasingly both parents worked, so we were starting to see um, that shift early on and through this time period of 65 to 80. So uh, the reference to latchkey kids, both mom and dad or both um, parents are working outside of the house and kids are letting themselves in at lunchtime and after school. Uh, we did see an increase in single parent households and certainly less parent child time. So again, it's sort of that, you know, that tough love parenting, you know, figure it out. Uh, both parents are working. Um, the values that we saw of this generation really focused in on balance, diversity, um, self resiliency was a major value area. Uh, moving from a more formal approach to an informal approach, uh, both personally and in the workplace. Um, independence, self-sufficiency, and more of a focus on, um, you know, some of that enjoyment, particularly when we talk about the workplace and seeking out an enjoyable, so not just work for the sake of work, work ethic equals worth ethic, the, more of an idea of balance. So when we look at um, this generation, we have a bit of an examination on what to expect at work. So what would those some of those characteristics look like? This is really where we saw that desire and the language even start um, for this idea of a work-life balance. Um, the idea of being more adaptable and moving among jobs. So whereas with our boomers, it wouldn't have been uncommon to have somebody um, you know, graduate high school or college they may remain with the same company their entire career. This is where we saw the big shift happening um, with um, Gen X. The idea of being more adaptable can easily move between jobs, for example. Um, and I see your note there, uh, Leah, in the chat around interesting, the baby boomer, boomers who come to mind first are quite frugal. Oh, that's maybe... Uh, uh, yeah, good note there. Maybe that's more um, of a rural influence. And that could be if we look at, it would be interesting actually to do an examination between rural and urban. Um, great point there, Leah, for sure. Um, so again, with what to expect at work, we started to see this idea of a work-life balance. Um, definitely with the introduction of personal computers, we started to have um, a little bit more of a tech savvy approach at work. And again, remember, that was just sort of the beginning of this idea of, well, what is, you know, more technically savvy. Um, they were very loyal employees, um, generally. So they certainly still did sort of work to live. It wasn't live to work, you know, it was the work to live, but starting to look for a little bit of that balance. Um, you'll often also see this idea of working smarter, because again, we had the introduction of the personal computer. Um, other things that we saw um, when we talk about that in um, the informality becoming a little bit more informal, this is also where we saw that shift in the workplace. So again, per, um, preference for a more casual work environment, very common with this group. Um, generally, these are individuals that are excellent task managers. They can get things done. They want feedback. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, 
and they really uh, value independence at work. So we started to see a little bit of that shift, you know, from the hierarchical more to um, less micro or preference for less micromanagement. So again, think about these characteristics. We look at the generations coming together today um, and working together or aware those challenges might be in them working together. Um, next group, we'll see how this resonates with our next group. I uh, want to have a look at our Generation Y. So again, often referred to as millennials, born between 1981 and 1995. Again, I, to set that tone for what are um, what helped create these uh, generational personalities, I've included some of the biggest influencers, uh, again, pop culture and home life and growing up. So again, 9-11 um, as an influencer, um, introduction of the internet, um, smartphones, the Columbine disaster, OJ Simpson trial, I just pulled a few um, just to sort of uh, resonate with the things that were happening during that period of time. Uh, pop culture, American Idol, tattoos, Harry Potter, Lady, Lady Gaga, uh, iPods, laptops, again, internet, uh, Facebook. So think about how those started to set the change for the world that we know, uh, the, the way we know it now. Um, home life and growing up, often a uh, child of a single parent, <laughs> pardon me, um, as we saw increase in single parent uh, households, um, often uh, children were considered to be uh, perhaps sheltered, um, where the child was sort of the focus. Uh, sometimes you'll hear uh, folks talk about this idea of overparenting. So, you know, really sort of hovering over the children and uh, the children are the focus of what's happening. Um, children's schedules became more of a demand. So when we think about um, increased activities, for example, so trying to split time uh, between, you know, home life activity used to be, you know, homework. And now it's, well, we've got to get kids to their sporting events, for example. Uh, which was a reflection of the values, right? So looking for a little bit more fun, uh, a generation that's looking for things to happen with more immediacy. Um, also argued that there was um, certainly more of a, a self-owned confidence with this generation. Um, spirituality was another uh, core value that started to resonate with um, this particular group, civic duty, achievement, um, increasing tech savviness, and more of an awareness of the global community. So again, with our Gen Y group, if we have a look at how does this translate then, what to expect at work, um, what we started to see, innovation, thinking outside of the box. Now we have the internet. Um, now we have a way to connect globally. We recognize there's a global community. So this idea of innovation or thinking outside of the box, this group owns that for sure. Um, the idea of um, making the workplace more of a social space. So the idea of actually making friends at work, we're not just going in doing our job, that becomes part of the social network or the social circle. We saw a real shift with the Gen Y. Um, you know, certainly enjoy teamwork and at ease in working with teams. So that's just the norm for them. That idea of collaboration um, comes much more naturally than maybe other generations. Um, again, that increased tech savviness, so the idea of just not, not just tech, but digitally savvy, and um, in turn, realizing how much more they could multitask, how much more they could get done. Um, it is also argued that this generation can tend to have a strong sense of entitlement um, due to the overparenting. So the idea that it's, um, you know, perhaps in previous generations, you know, you work hard, you have to earn it. Whereas with this generation sometimes perceived <coughs> as a little bit more focused on self-entitlement. Again, globally minded, very ambitious. Um, they absolutely want a work-life balance and um, the generation that probably has the strongest sense of community involvement and self-development. So those are two categories when compared to others that actually weighted higher. Um, with this generation, which I thought was quite interesting when we talk about building our volunteer capacity or um, hiring employees that want to work in nonprofit, um, the idea that the individuals in Gen Y really have a strong sense of community involvement. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the 
This generation also, when we talk about what to expect at work, they want immediate feedback. So again, employees are volunteers in this category. If traditionally in your organization, you know, you build work plans and you maybe visit them uh, mid-year during the fiscal and at end of year, with this um, generation, that is also something to keep in mind that they actually want more immediate feedback. So don't wait, um, you know, until the end of that quarter to do a review or to provide feedback. They want it right away. Um, they do well uh, in mentoring type situations. So they want mentoring and they do well if they can have a mentor that they're working under. Um, they tend to be very collaborative, <coughs> uh, very creative. So again, uh, looking at, you know, that more global access to the world and to information. And they probably are the generation most that want to be challenged or take on new challenges. So again, some general characteristics when we look at um, what to expect at work. I'm just gonna pop over to the chat for a moment. Um, Cause I do see, do we see any interesting trends in micro generations? Um, oh, <laughs> there are a number of interesting um, trends, most certainly. Um, you know, as we get into, and we don't examine it today, but thanks for, um, Thanks for the question um, that came in. I see there's a couple of other comments uh, where we actually get into looking at, you know, the next generation, sometimes referred to as alphas. Um, so once we look at, um, once we look at our Gen Z, um, the next generation sometimes referred to as alphas. And there are some interesting trends there. Um, and longer, Carla, I feel like a, when you say I feel like a hybrid, they're, they're absolutely, and remember, there's no distinct end, you know, when we look at these years, right, it's not a distinct start and end for those um, period of years that are defined. So I often find folks will say, well, I've got a little bit of that, you know, I might have a bit of those boomer tendencies, but I've also become quite agile in how I do work. Or I'll look at, um, you know, our Gen Ys, who have even said to me, you know, like, I care so much about community and so much like younger generations, so much about community that it often resonates with um, sort of that, um, that, you know, that work ethic, it translates directly into that work ethic. And they'll say to me, well, I feel like I've got that boomer characteristic. So again, it's certainly not a clear cut. There's lots of gray here, folks, put it that way. Definitely not black and white between those lines. Um, so yeah, not, not uncommon to feel like maybe a little bit of a hybrid model for sure. <laughs> I, I like that reference. Um, so let's have a look at now folks. Um, we'll just pop over and have a look next at uh, our um, final generation that I wanted to examine. And again, I've left it a little bit open-ended here when we talk about Gen, Gen Z born in 1996. And then, as I say, you know, the more contemporary, some will say, you know, up to 2000, 2001, and then we have referred to by some as the next would be the alpha generation. Um, so again, no clear lines between. However, in the workforce today, when we're looking at those four generations, um, looking at the Gen Z group, um, Gen Z group, <laughs> Gen Z group. Uh, what were some of the biggest influencers? Um, the first African-American president, uh, Great Recession, marriage equality, uh, digital, um, being in a digital space is the norm. It's no longer um, unusual or um, the growthfulness around digital or tech savviness. It's the norm, it's an expectation. Uh, climate change also is a big influencer. Um, pop culture, again, you can see um, how we move forward with pop culture, iPhones, YouTube, um, Snapchat was one I included. Um, again, different shows or other things that resonate with pop culture during this time. Um, the home life and the growing up, again, um, families affected by the recession, um, socially minded, and the idea of raised to make an impact. So making a difference, um, being globally minded, thinking about community, thinking about global community and wanting to make a difference. Um, inclusive classrooms, that was um, certainly that something that we saw a shift. Non-traditional family norms and uh, return of extended family households. So as the recession uh, was impactful for many, we did see multiple uh, generations living in the same household. We also saw with increased um, immigration, so new to Canada, for example, uh, multiple um, generations living in the same household. 
So again, those were some of the top um, pieces around um, home life and growing up. The values, um, the value of security. So even when we look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? We need to satisfy, um, you know, those physiological needs. Those have to be satisfied. Once we have, you know, food and water and shelter, then we can, you know, we move to that next level in the hierarchy. Uh, we need security and safety. The value of security. Um, this generation also values competition, independence, and um, the the generation that we saw the most significant um, increase in entrepreneurship. So um, think about that as well when we look at this idea of what to expect at work. So again, with this generation, what to um, expect at work. One thing that's really interesting, although um, digital norm is, or digi digital engagement has become the norm, this group actually may prefer face-to-face -face conversation. So you would think that they would do best in a, you know, um, a remote work environment, hybrid work, you know, in a Zoom space for engagement, but this generation actually may prefer face-to-face -face communication. Um, again, they have that digital, you know, um, space is their norm. So for them working on an initiative, they may want to actually be together face-to-face. -to -face. Um, there are some that argue that uh, with this generation, they want to make a difference but that they're more motivated by having a secure life. So they really want to make sure um, stable, secure from a monetary standpoint. Um, they value information on demand. So that, um, that increase around immediacy we see with this generation most certainly. Uh, what to see at work or what to expect at work? Um, strong ability to multitask, the best generation to date. Um, they really can leverage all of those digital capacities in a way um, that makes them, you know, the strongest when it comes to the ability to multitask. Um, they may require more additional training with customer interactions, particularly face-to-face, -face, because this may not be a space that they've worked a whole lot in. So think about that. Um, this generation also may, out of all of the generations, be the one that will actually pick up on new tasks more quickly than any other generation. So again, when we're thinking about the type of work that individuals are doing, um, as we're attracting employees and volunteers, thinking about that preference. So as a broad overview then of our four generations, the other piece that I wanted to share with you um, that I thought you might find quite interesting, just pop over to the chat, uh, and I see, oh, Janet, hi, Janet. Multitasking can take take a toll on your health, so might not be the best to encourage it. Fair enough. Yeah, without that work life balance, and you know, as we saw in um, the quote from um, the Sundap earlier uh, from Google, one of the articles that he wrote, um, it was absolutely around that the idea of living the organization's values. Are you saying work life balance, or are you living it? Are you demonstrating it? So again, um, multitasking, yeah, can be a great thing, but um, do we have a bigger risk to individuals? Um, Bill, I see you said, I feel like a hybrid or a chameleon who has picked up traits as I've gone along. You bet. We're not just informed by the events and the conditions um, for that period of time. That continues to happen, right? So our field of reference, our cognitive bubble, our field of experience continues to grow. So not uncommon um, to be a bit of a chameleon and to take on new traits. Um, you went on to write there, Bill, the exception is that the biggest influencers and in pop culture have been determined by yeah, Canadian events versus US events. Yeah, you bet, absolutely. So um, great comments, folks. Um, I wanted to also share with you just on the next slide, I thought you might be interested just to see a little bit of a snapshot of what organizations are seeking, uh, both in their volunteers and their employees for skill set and how that's changed um, over the last few years. Um, this little summary comes from um, Forbes does an overview every year that looks at what employers, um, both in for profit and nonprofit, are asking for. And these are the skills that have been identified that employers are seeking. And of course, I wanted to demonstrate to you what has changed over the last, uh, I just took the last three years, which these have been quite the last three years given um, the global pandemic. 
So you can see in 2020, um, the number one very quickly jumped to data literacy. So as we entered the pandemic and the absolute need and requirement to engage in a more virtual or remote space, um, data literacy, critical thinking, tech savviness kind of all fleshed out to the top. As we moved into 2021, you can see that, you know, a little bit of a, you know, starting to have a little bit of a movement towards um, post pandemic processes, getting back to them. But the reality was nothing came all the way back to the way it was before. So the idea of a growth mindset, continuous learning, again, critical thinking came um, fairly high at the top, survival skills. So it was really interesting. In around this time, we also saw, you know, many of us will ask, um, behavioral questions when we're doing interviews for employees and staff, um, as well as for our volunteers. So we'll be looking at sort of that, um, you know, emotional intelligence or EI sometimes refer referred to, that quotient around emotional EQ. Uh, what we started to see in 2021 was actually a new quotient that talked about um, adaptability. So flexibility, adaptability, um, being able to be a change manager. So they referred to it as a change quotient. How quickly can an individual sense and respond to change in their environment? And again, that was a direct um, sort of byproduct of the pandemic and the circumstances we saw there. Um, oh, I, I love that, Leah. 2021 comfort with amb ambiguity. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, and then if you look at last year and um, just the snapshot that Forbes gave here, uh, top 10 skills in 2022, empathetic listening, uh, agility, flexibility, and adaptability, 100% at the top, increased um, opportunities for use of modern communication in all forms, um, emotional intelligence, again, really came up to the top, creative thinking, uh, so on and so forth. And you know, it's interesting because we still saw the network, the data analysis pieces, um, but equally so, um, we also see that as more of a norm. So it's about modern communication and how adaptable, flexible um, can we be with it. So again, I thought you might find that just of a little bit of interest when we look at um, when we look at what has changed over the last couple of years. And I know each of you will have experienced this in a different way. Um, other interesting information I thought you might uh, want to consider when we talk about this idea of, well, what to expect at work. So for each of those generations, I've given you an idea of what they might expect at work. Um, and also thinking about this. So on average, when given the hours that we have to work with in a week, um, about 50 to 70% is spent preparing for work, actually doing working, thinking about work. So again, when we talk about this idea of really endeavoring to have a work-life balance, um, living the values of the organization and considering um, what the value of each of those generations through their generational personality, what that's looking like and their appetite or need for that flexibility. So how has that translated? And we certainly know um, even coming out of last year and many organizations, again, in moving back, to those pre-pandemic processes, many said it's not going to look like this. Uh, it's not going to look the, like the way it did before. We are actually going to adopt, you know, a permanent, um, you know, blended work model. Many organizations have done that. They've said, okay, this is actually supporting work-life balance. We really don't care where the work gets done as long as it gets done and to the quality that's required. So again, um, when we look at that 50 to 70% of those um, you know, waking hours that we have to work with, and remember, we're still trying to balance um, you know, family. We saw many, many examples where um, you know, during the pandemic, students that were away at university moved back home to um, individuals, you know, adults in the household that you know, worked outside of the household. Now they're trying to work at home. Um, aging parents that are living with individuals and we're all trying to do this within that space of the home environment. So again, um, how much time do we have to work with and how are we going to support um, that work-life balance and how are we going to really support um, and understand the values that each of those generations have and really play to those values when and where and how we can. 
So again, this really sets the stage for something I think is critically important when we're focusing on intergenerational um, individuals, not just working, but I always say working well together. And these are just a few of the benefits if we actually take that time to be mindful, um, be curious, a genuine, authentic desire to understand the values of the individuals in our organization based on their generation, um, but also in alignment to our own organizational values. So it's not just about, um, you know, the working together, how can we work well together? And th those are the strategies that I want to cover with you um, for the last portion um, of our time together. Uh, benefits, as you can see here, you're going to see reduced volunteer employee turnover, you're going to see reduced absenteeism and illness, you will see increased productivity, uh, longer retention time of those employees, um, longer retention time of those volunteers. And, you know, we looked at why it matters. You just have to look at the dollars um, as one lens or one aspect of why it's so important to get this right. So again, um, when we look at, well, how can we do it better then? There are four specific strategies I wanted to share with you. Um, there are many more, but I selected four that I thought really can be the most impactful or make the most difference. Um, the first one is really a focus on commonality and where we don't have commonality through those various generations, we do have it in our organizations and you do have it um, in your um, shared mission vision and the shared values of the organization. So again, if we look at what the majority of staff and volunteers want, and these this has been pulled um, with some research that I did um, for both staff in and employees in nonprofit organizations and volunteers, the number one positive workplace culture, that's the number one. I want to be in a space whether you know I care passionately, I want to give back to community, I'm volunteering, I'm passionate, I want to give back to community, I want to do that in a space that really feels like home. It is positive um, in all interactions. Um, the second that resonated both, again, employees and volunteers to feel successful, um, recognition in some form, but generally in the nonprofit sector, you know, although we say some individuals, you know, need immediate feedback, for example, with the one generation I shared with you, um, recognition in some form, but it wasn't the top, um, you know, the monetary side and even the acknowledgement uh, wasn't the top. It came in about third. So we do have commonality there. Um, interest in career development. And one of the interesting things we saw there is that very often volunteers um, that are still working in their professional careers um, actually aren't all that interested in contributing to nonprofit organizations in their professional capacity. So for example, if I'm a, an accountant or a lawyer, when I'm volunteering to sit on that board of directors, I actually just want to park my professional stuff and I just want to give back to community. So again, um, this idea of career development, it can be for some, um, but not for all. Um, workplace flexibility, again, being able to sense and respond to what people need to balance their um, work and their home lives and all of their personal um, commitments. A uh, sense of personal satisfaction and, uh, and um, being fairly compensated was also one that came up. So again, the idea of focusing on com um, the commonalities between those various generations, focusing on the commonalities between staff and volunteers. And I could talk much more about that, you guys, the idea of not differentiating between staff and volunteers. I mean, we do, obviously we have to differentiate. One is volunteering, one staff. But how we build job descriptions, having job descriptions for every volunteer position, doing a proper recruitment process for your volunteers the same way that you would with staff, doing a proper recruitment process for your board of directors, same as you would do with staff. So um, again, much more that we could talk about in that realm, but as a strategy, focusing on commonalities. Um, the second one that I wanted to talk about is really capitalizing on, on advantages. If you are so very lucky and fortunate enough to have those four distinct generations in your organization, you have an incredible opportunity to tap into the best of the best of each of those generations. So I've just listed a few here um, in support of better decision making, uh, more lenses, more approaches, more ideas, uh, maybe more innovation from some of the demographic, um, maybe some you know experiential, lived experience. Um, from other generations that may be in your organization. 
So the idea of really capitalizing on those diverse talents, um, the idea of increased innovation through some of our perhaps younger generations, but recognizing those were also the ones that said, well, um, you know, I really like being mentored and I want to work under somebody who has that lived experience. So again, thinking about capitalizing on advantages. Um, the third one, folks communicate openly about preferences to really acknowledge each generation's difference. Um, this includes communication preferences, obviously, um, depending on the level of comfort level with um, technology or how tech savvy, um, thinking about work ethics. So we looked at, you know, what to expect at work for each of those generations. Uh, what does that look like? What is their expectation on feedback? What is the immediacy that it might be required? Um, what is the definition of work-life balance within the organization? And equally so, when we do find, you know, sort of um, conflict arising between the various sort of approaches or lenses, what are our mechanisms in place to resolve that conflict? So again, um, with this idea about communicating openly about preferences, this is where um, I'm going to focus in on the tool that Lynn will share with you after the webinar. So I just want to flag that when we talk about those generations differences, um, because the fun little tool that I've included for you is a very quick, easy way and fun, very engaging way to get at some pretty cool conversation around an open and honest uh, conversation and communication around uh, preferences. So we'll have a look at that before we wrap up the session today. Um, the next piece that I want to share with you, the fourth strategy, um, this really goes back to where we started and ties in um, creating that positive organizational culture. So again, I've included a few, um, a few things to think about. Honestly, folks, any one of these could be something that we could do a separate webinar on. Uh, when we talk about looking at and acknowledging common trends, in a generation while recognizing individual differences. And often um, this will dovetail somewhat over into looking at um, EDI, equity, diversity, inclusive practices. So providing um, opportunity for EDI opportunities. And I know Lynn, you said uh, with Black History Month, there's, you know, that's again, the upcoming webinar, perfect opportunity for organizations to actually um, take advantage of some of those um, EDI training opportunities. Um, delivering on work-life balance, the idea of zero tolerance for rejection and discrimination. So again, building um, policy and really having that lived value within the organization, encouraging cross-generational mentoring. Um, again, for individuals that want that mentoring and you have the benefit of having um, that lived experience in the organization, uh, mentoring or shadowing type opportunities for new employees, new volunteers. Um, again, establishing opportunities for team members to connect with one another um, outside of the work setting, or I've said here a neutral setting. So the idea of really satisfying that socialization piece, part of why I want to be in the organization is to satisfy some of that socialization. So again, think about opportunities um, for embedding those activities within the organization as well. Um, I know with one of my clients, uh, we do a um, a South Sask Independent Living Center, we do uh, a staff um, volunteer and volunteer um, golf tournament every year. And then in the winter months, we do a mini golf. So for our persons with disabilities that um, can't fully participate in our uh, physical golf outside, they, they do the jobs of taking the photos and driving the golf carts. In the winter months, we have um, a mini golf opportunity. And again, just that opportunity to connect on a personal level, get outside and into a space that's um, really neutral for everybody that's um, participating. So again, another really fantastic um, opportunity to leverage and, and demonstrate that value um, of the organization. So again, looking at um, the organizational values, spending the time to do this, looking at the structure policies um, for both employees and volunteers. What are your recruitment strategies like? Um, have you really embraced inclusivity and is that reflected um, generational diversity as well as other diversity considerations, um, not just, you know, not just included, but really being encouraged in an authentic way. So again, four strategies that can go a long way in starting um, to move through and break down some of these barriers around generational divide. 
as I say, um, the one I really wanted to focus in on was recognizing those differences. So we've talked about them today. We've looked at, um, you know, what were some of the biggest, you know, global influencers? Uh, what did pop culture look like? What did home life uh, growing up look like? What, um, how did that translate into a generational personality when it comes to uh, what to expect at work? And um, now taking all of that information and really bring it back to your own organization. So it, how are we going to do that? So I did put together one tool, and I think you will have some fun with it, that will allow us to get into this space. So the idea of really looking at, despite the generalities, um, you know, the characteristics of each generation, to really do a more meaningful job um, within each of your organizations. So to look at what individuals um, value most, because, and we saw it today in the chat, many people feel like they're a chameleon or a bit of a hybrid. Um, so again, to do that at your own organizational level, uh, having a look at, well, what motivates us? What are our preferences? Um, what do those values look like? And can we provide a little bit more clarity around it? And I always say it's not just for um, us as individuals. It's always very interesting. If you've done any type of, you know, Myers-Briggs personality um, or preference testing, uh, colors preference testing, there's countless different ways and opportunities to do this. Um, it's pretty fantastic. We learn a lot about ourselves. But I think the real benefit here with the generational divide is to be able to really recognize the character characteristics and traits of others and particularly the commonality amongst individuals in the organization. So the tool I'm going to leave you with, a um, little bit of a fun exercise. Uh, again, Lynn is going to send this out to you after the webinar today. Um, what you're going to do is take this away. You could use it with um, your staff and volunteers. You could use it with your board of directors. You can use it with different committees or working groups. Um, which will help you as individuals and as a fun team exercise to really look at preferences, um, characteristics of each individual when you have an intergenerational team. So the idea is that when you complete this very short exercise, there will be um, categories of preference and those categories will attach to what you see here, um, a lion, a beaver, an otter, or a golden retriever. So what you're going to do with the exercise Lynn will send you, um, I want you to take it back to your organizations, um, distribute it to folks, perhaps you do it as an icebreaker or in a team meeting, you can do that in person or remotely. Uh, the idea is that you don't want anyone spending more than five minutes on this. I don't want anybody overthinking it to get a real sense of those preferences. We want this to be a fairly expedited exercise, which is why it works so well as an icebreaker. So for each of these um, lines, as you work horizontally across the screen, you're going to ask individuals to select the item that is most like themselves and put a number four beside it. The next one that is next like themselves that they identify with, they would put a number three, so on and so forth. So we're working horizontally across the screen or across the form that Lynn will send you for each of those 10 categories. You will then have individuals total up those columns and those columns will align with the town and Smalley, uh, pardon me, uh, Smalley and Trent model of human uh, typology that talks about our preferences. So it's a really, really fun opportunity, uh, short exercise, shouldn't take long, don't let it take long, um, to really explore some of those intergenerational um, preferences and that entire array of preferences that we looked at today. So again, um, you know, nothing's carved in stone, but you'll certainly see where some of these preferences around um, how we engage and how we work are sort of fleshed out. And once we see that, as they say, okay, it's kind of insightful for ourselves, probably won't be a whole lot of surprises individually. But as soon as we have that recognition of the preferences of those around us, we can start um, breaking down those barriers between how we communicate, um, how we organize uh, materials, how much time somebody needs to contemplate or think about something before making a decision versus individuals that are, you know, maybe more inclined to um, be more agile, more flexible, or quicker in decision making. So I will leave you with, um, with the Smalley and Trent exercise. I'll have Lynn send that out. 
Uh, I do hope that folks have an opportunity um, to play around with that within your own organizations. And always curious to hear what the results are. So we'll have to uh, um, maybe find opportunity as you're carrying out these exercises in your organizations. Shoot me an email. Uh, how did it go? Did it help? in breaking down some of those or understanding those intergenerational um, differences and perspectives. So again, I'll leave you with that. And one last final piece, um, which comes from Stephen Covey. And I think this is, you know, um, real key in bridging that generational divide, looking at uh, authentic way to build genuine collaboration within the organization. Um, otherwise, you know, we're simply just coordinating, maybe we're cooperating but it really is trust that gets us to a place where we can transform you know, those group of individuals, be the employees or volunteers into a real team, a real high functioning team. So again, making that investment, taking the time um, to learn those perspectives. And as I say, the small Trent tool is just a small little example or a small little mechanism to get that conversation started, to create that strategy number three around um, communicating openly about um, preferences and, and differences and how we prefer to engage. So I will leave you with that. And as always, Lynn, I've hardly left us a moment for our question and answer. I always say I try to leave 15 minutes, but uh, we've, we're running up to the end of our time. But with that being said, you know, I'm more than happy um, to stick around, have a bit of a conversation, any other comments uh, that folks might have or anyone that might want to uh, might want to ask any questions. And I just want to acknowledge in uh, in the chat, Megan, your, your note as well, it's important to ask your teams what their perception of a neutral setting may be. Oh, when we talked about doing neutral setting, uh, for example, often there, there are only opportunities focused on sporting activities agreed, um, and those activities are not comfortable for all. So I certainly agree, just a thought based on uh, your past leadership experience, can you find some more appropriate activities that match your team and their comfort levels? 100%, yeah, be, to be very mindful of that, good point. So with that folks, again, um, happy to answer any questions that may come up. I'll just monitor the chat. Did I need, uh, miss any um, Lynn through the course of the webinar? Because I always do try to keep an eye on the chat, but I know I can sometimes miss comments or questions that come up. Oh, I think you uh, covered everything that I saw anyways. Um... Okay, good. Good. And uh, again, um, you know, as folks are sort of taking this away, going back into your own organizations, um, I would certainly, as I say, invite you and would look welcome, uh, would welcome um, hearing how it's going in your organizations. Are there things that um, you know, have improved perhaps once we spend a little bit of time on the culture and the value connection and really um, understanding the perspectives of those generations. So again, um, don't hesitate to reach out folks. I'm always happy to hear from you, you know that. And any other questions and concerns that could be on this workshop or any of the others that have been delivered in the past, I'm always happy to have a chat. I know I see a few familiar faces in the room and lots of new faces actually. So um, great to have that time with you today. Well, thanks very much, Sherry. We're definitely uh, drawing uh, to a close. Uh, we've only had a couple of minutes here. I don't know if there's anyone from the floor that has just a, a quick question they might want to ask. Uh, or um, hmm. I would like to invite all of you who are here today, uh, if you've got ideas for uh, future workshops, to please shoot them to me. We take direction from community and everything that we do. So. Um, we are always uh, mindful of that and we'll definitely pass it by our community advisory committee that plans the uh, projects. And um, seeing no one kind of jumping up and, uh, and knowing how busy everybody is, I think I'll just uh, leave you with, uh, if you're not part of our email list already to learn about future opportunities, please uh, just shoot me a note at lynn.gidluck at uregina.ca and I'd be very happy to add you to our list. Uh, please mark February 7th on, uh, and join us uh, for our next workshop. So thank you and have a wonderful day. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. See you soon.